Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, not for me, not for me. For the exhibition, the exhibition. So obviously, uh, my name's John. I look after the events program for the library, and it's been an absolute thrill to uh, work on the program to accompany the exhibition, Fantasy Realms of the o uh, Imagination, which opened uh, just over a week ago and is running till the 25th of February. Um, tonight is uh, going to be a very special evening. I'm so glad you're here. And obviously, everybody watching us online, wherever you may be around the world, it's great to have you with us. I hope you feel part part of the occasion. Um, so tonight we are obviously taking a journey into fairyland. Now that sounds lovely, but maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I think our, maybe our speakers will tell you something about that tonight. So we're having a wonderful conversation. We have some superb writers, uh, experts on folklore. We have the, the musicians. We have the, we have t really a fantastic build for you tonight. Uh, on stage in a minute, you'll meet Ella Kushner, uh, Jeanette Ning, and Terry Windling. And they'll be talking to Robert Maslin, who stepped in at pretty short notice to chair tonight's event, and he is um, uh, he is professor of fantasy and early modern literature at the University of Glasgow, and also the founder of the Centre for Fantasy and the Fantastic. So that's you know doesn't get more fantastic than that, does it? So um, during the event, uh, you'll get uh, towards the end of the end, you probably have a chance to have questions if we're running to time. If you want to uh, open a question and you're watching at home, there's a form beneath the video window. You can do that. After the event, we have some of our speakers are. Uh, have their books outside, so please do come and, and pick up a book and have it signed later on. Just a brief word about the exhibition, Fantasy uh, Realms of the Imagination. We, we think it's one of, the, one of the biggest and best of it's ever of mounted. It ranges from all-time classics, going back to, you know, the, for the only surviving manuscript for Beowulf, the Alice manuscripts where Mervyn peaks, right through to the, con to the, you know, the cream of contemporary fiction from uh, around the world. There are games, there are costumes, there are... There film there's so much in there it's, it's really worth getting along to it if that is your thing um, as I say it's uh, it's open to the end of February we've got some great events uh, we've had a few problems with our website recently so uh, you, uh, they will be uh, findable in due course so uh, please do check that out I think that's all plenty from me please welcome to uh, the stage our speakers for this evening Good evening. Uh, so my name's uh, Rob Maslin. Uh, I'm Professor of Fantasy and Early Modern Literature at the University of Glasgow, or I was until I retired. Uh, let's hear it for retirement. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was also co-founder of the Glasgow Centre for Fantasy and the Fantastic. Uh, my friend and colleague, Matt, was one of the curators of a brilliant uh, fantasy exhibition at the British Library. So do please try to go if you possibly can. It's I think a bit of a life-changing experience. Tonight, however, will also be a bit of a life-changing experience, I think. Um, our subject is journey to the land of fairy and telling the tale. So I'm guessing most of you know what you understand by the land of fairy and have some inkling of how to get there. But it might be worth remembering what Tolkien said about it in his essay on fairy stories, first given as a lecture in 1939. There he calls fairy the perilous realm and goes on, I will not attempt to define that nor to describe it directly. It cannot be done. Fairy cannot be caught in a net of words for it's one of its qualities to be indescribable, though not imperceptible. 1939, the year when he gave that talk, is most famous as the time is forever associated with the outbreak of war. At the end of another war in 1918, the Birmingham artist, Bernard Slay, drew what he called an ancient map of fairyland, which features at the start of the fantasy exhibition. In fact, a lot of visitors have never got beyond the map. <laughs> because you've got so much in it, you'll spend the rest of your visit time uh, looking at details. Um, so you can learn more about these details from the booklet he published to go with it of the land of fairy under the way there too, 
where he encourages readers to find a trustworthy guide to the country and recommends a non-binary fairy for the job called Friedlein, neither girl nor boy, who varies in height from six inches to 12 feet. <laughs> so inquiries are going on as to Friedlein's availability. <laughs> <clears throat> in the meantime, we have four human guides to help us make the journey to fairy tonight and to tell the tale when we get back. It's very important to get back safely. Uh, there are three writers and a musician. The musician will be joining us later. Here, then, are the writers. Uh, though it's not possible to, find any of, to, to define any of them solely as writers, as you'll see. I'll begin with Ellen Kushner. Ellen's first novel, Swords Point, is the cult classic that's kicked off what's sometimes called the fantasy of manners. She followed it up with the lyrical fairy novel, Thomas the Rhymer, which won the World Fantasy Award and the Mythopoeic Award, and recently became a Golanx fantasy masterwork. She then returned to the world of Swords Point, first with The Privilege of the Sword, which won the Locus Award, then The Fall of the Kings, co-written with Delia Sherman, and the collaborative prequel, Tremontaine. Kushner also had a lengthy career as a public radio host in Boston, which I hope will show itself tonight, ultimately creating and hosting her own national series, Sound and Spirit. She was one of the original authors for Terry Windling's Borderlands sequence of novels and short stories set mostly in Bordertown, which is kind of awkwardly sighted on the edge of both the Elflands and the world. She was a folk singer in her 20s and now lives in New York City with her wife, the author and educator Delia Sherman, who is also with us in the audience, uh, along with a great many theater and airplane ticket stubs. <laughs> but they're not here. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Jeanette Ng, uh, who is an author best known for her 2017 novel, Under the Pendulum Sun, a novel of the Fae, for which she won the Sidney J. Bounds Award for Best Newcomer, at the 2018 British Fantasy Awards and the Astounding Award for Best New Writer in 2019. Therein lies a tale, because one year later, she won the Hugo Award for Best Related Work, which you can actually see in the exhibition. And she received this for giving a speech which was responsible for changing the name of the award she received from the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer to the Astounding Award for Best New Writer, on account of Campbell's well-documented fascism. <laughs> Originally from Hong Kong, Jeanette now lives in Durham, UK. She has an MA in Medieval and Renaissance Studies. She runs live role-play games, performs hair wizardry, which I'm hoping she will do on me, and sometimes <laughs> has opinions on the internet. <clears throat> Thirdly, Terry, Terry Windling, she is a writer, an editor, an artist, and a folklorist, specializing in fantasy and the mythic arts. She's published over 40 books, received 10 World Fantasy Awards, including the Life at Lifetime Achievement Award in 2022, the Mythopaic Award, the Bram Stoker Award, and the SFWA Solstice Award. She's edited fantasy fiction since the 1980s, working with many of the major writers in the field, including Ellen, of course. She also writes fiction for adults and children, a non-fiction on a wide variety of mythic subjects, most notably for this evening's purpose, The Woodwife of 1996, about fairies in 1990s Arizona. She's worked on fairy books with artists Brian and Wendy Froud, who are also represented in the exhibition, edited an anthology of fairy fiction, The Fairy Reel, with Ellen Datlow, participated in Modern Fairies, a year-long project initiated by the musician Faye Heald and the, author, and the scholar Carolyn Larrington, bringing 13 folk musicians, artists, and writers together to create new works based on traditional stories. So I think you'll agree we've got some pretty expert guides to the field lying ahead of us. Who better to answer a string of questions from me? Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll see whether we have time for questions from you as well afterwards. It all depends how, <laughs> how long we go on for, really. <clears throat> so um, that's what I'll be doing in the first part of the event. I'll be asking a few questions. Um, in the second part, however, 
we'll be entering fairy itself. By way of a dramatization of Ellen's novel, Thomas the Rhymer, performed by Ellen herself and the amazing musician Sam Lee, about whom more afterwards. So, Ellen, Jeanette, and uh, Terry, here are some of the questions. I like this. <laughs> so all three of you have written brilliant novels engaging with fairy and its inhabitants. In spite of Tolkien, do you have any kind of definition or description of fairy which you'd like to share with us? I'm with Tolkien. <laughs> I, I really am. Um, I think fairy is the unknowable and the dangerous and the thing that makes being a writer interesting and important, especially a writer of fantasy, is that it is your self that goes into the novels that you write. Um, you cannot but partake of your truest self or else they're not very good. <laughs> and so I think from each writer, you will get a different fairy depending on what they find unknowable, what they find uh, terrifying, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we each contain our own fairy. I love that answer. Yeah, can't, can't better that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like, um, I, I think fairies, um, in contrast to a lot of other kind of like, um, like elves or dwarves or a lot of the kind of fantasy races you see in a lot of fantasy fiction, all of whom are fantastic. Um, but I think fairy to me, the, the kind of distinction between fairies or versus say D and D elves um, is that they, they, there was a mythopoetic element to them that they represent uh, a externalized other, something that we fear, um, something that, you know, the, the explanation we give to the strange thing that goes bump in the night. And obviously, you know, you could say, well, yeah, that's the same thing we say of vampires or whatever, but th there is something both very appealing um, and very not about it. And it's the sort of the third path when, you know, when, when you know, Thomas the Rhymer, the three paths, one goes to heaven, one goes to hell, and then there's the one that goes to fairyland. And, and if fairyland to me is that mix and the third path is kind of very much entrenched in that. Um, and, and it's that kind of slightly undefinable reflection that, that I, I think it's, it's the, the you, you look past, I, there's a silly passage in my book where, you know, one of the fairies says, you know, you, you look past your borders um, and your seas and you, you don't see the people there, you see us instead. Um, and you want to see us and you keep looking for us, even though, you know, they're, they're perfectly reasonable, normal people there, but you don't, you don't see them. You, you, you're looking for the fairies. And, mm -hmm. and to me, it's like kind of that thing where um, kind of historically, um, you kind of like looking at, say, like, um, um, different eras have different kind of rises of fairy stories where, um, so when, you know, um, James I was on the throne, um, or, you know, James VI, if you're going for Scottish. Um, <laughs> sorry. The sixth. Thank you, Rob. Um, <laughs> I remember that. Um, um, which, uh, and, and when, you know, when people, and that time, because there was a fear of witches, um, um, and you know, it was all about the witches, um, people stopped telling so many fairy stories because suddenly your, witch, your, your, your milk sours, not because of fairies, but because of witches, and then that, that, that kind of got going. And it's a sort of similar way nowadays, you know, there are not, not so many fairy stories, a lot more alien stories, and mm. kind of the, that space. And I think it's, it's that space that, that to me has something to do with fairies as well, which can be occupied by other things like aliens, like witches, um, but, but it, I think it has to fit that, that, that space there, or out there. I love it that you brought out the, uh, the idea of the third way. You've got the, uh, from, from, from the ballad of Thomas the Rhymer, you've got the, the road, to the straight and narrow road that goes to heaven, you've got the, the lovely flowery road that leads to hell, and then there's this weird third way and it leads who knows where. And uh, yeah, I, I, you, you absolutely captured that. All, all three of you have captured that in your writing, I think. Um, so the fantasy exhibition gives us a rich range of fairy texts from before the 20th century. There's the medieval poems, the Gawain and the Green Knight, where a fairy is a gigantic giant with a green ax. Uh, you've got a border ballad to Thomas the Rhymer that we've already mentioned. Uh, we've got Shakespeare's play, A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, we've got Christina Rossetti's poem, Goblin Market, and so on. 
Can you tell us about uh, the pre-20th century roots of fairy tales as you see them? We've already begun a little bit on that, but uh, which, of, which, which, if any, of these roots have been important to you? I would say all of them. Mm. Um, as I started out, my love of fairy lore started out with literature, with children's literature and then adult literature that made use of fairy folklore. And from there, I went back to the old text and uh, studied folklore in university and, and went back and back and back into the very many different ways that fairy lore has been expressed through the centuries and from continent to continent, because of course there are fairy-like creatures in various mythologies all around the world. Mm -hmm. And how can you just pick one? Mm -hmm. That The wonderful thing about fairy lore is that it is so mutable mm -hmm. that as Ellen was saying, we all bring our own desires, our own um, relationship with the other, with the fairy world, mm -hmm. to our engagement with these texts. So every single piece that you just cited, and that's in the fantasy exhibition, has another building block to add to this wealth of fairy lore that we have and that we as writers and artists draw upon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I can't pick just one. All of those things are important. You've immersed yourself so deeply in such a range of traditions. Yeah. Now, Catherine Briggs, who is one of the great folklorists looking at fairy lore, Every, all different folklorists have, have had different classifications and divisions and ways that they've talked about fairy lore and how they, sometimes classifying them absolutely to death. Mm. I agree with Tolkien that if you lose the mystery of them, you, lo you lose your grasp of fairyland. Mm -hmm. Catherine Briggs has a classification where she has the trooping fairies and the solitary fairies. The trooping fairies tend to be the courtly fairies. And there are wonderful stories about fairy courts and fairy princes and fairy queens. Then there are the solitary fairies that tend to be associated with landscape, the fairies of hill and stream and very specific places. Those are the ones that are the most important to me because they embody my favorite thing about fairy lore, which is it's a beautiful connection to the numinous qualities of the lands we live in. And these stories are a way of talking about that enchantment, that inexpressible wonder that one can find, or fear that one can find by being in the natural world. And so though that, that area of fairy lore is the most important to me, where it connects with the natural world. Mm -hmm. I think that connection with the genus loci is kind of the, the, the thing that really um, fascinates me because there's sometimes a temptation um, when uh, fairies kind of get uprooted um, and, and I... <clears throat> And I sometimes kind of read some kind of modern um, fairy tale kind of inspired works where you have fairies, um, but you know, it's, it's we're, we're all the way in America, but you know, the Hawthorne and you starts, keeps working. And, it's, and it's, it always feels like the author has read in like a, a, a fairy tale kind of encyclopedia somewhere that Hawthorne's very important or, or, um, or the mistletoe is very important or you is very important, but it doesn't, it, it is not imbued with the qualities of why it's important, it becomes, a, a litany, a, a one more magical ingredient that's just from a book, rather than evoking that sense of where it's from and why. And, and I say this because of, I, I was that person growing up in Hong Kong in a landscape full of concrete, and I read the books that tell you, oh, these are the important things, and this is magical. And I'm like, oh, that sounds really magical, but they were magical words that had that sounded wonderful and beautiful and poetic, but. It's not until I saw a yew tree in the graveyard and I was like, oh, that's why it's magical because you suddenly, you see it in the graveyard and it's this, this kind of this, or, this circle of death, or, well, of absence of grass around it. And you know, you look at the graveyard, there are lots of trees, that tree, that tree is definitely magical because it has that shape and, and the roots and, and you know, nothing grows near it. Mm. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Mm. And, and that's like, or like a mistletoe, like in the winter, when suddenly you look at a tree, yeah. everything seems dead. And then that's like one thing right at the top with leaves. And you're like, I, I don't trust that. that. That thing is very suspicious, very magical. I don't like it. And, and I think it's that there is a temptation when things get categorized and mm. they, they become, and you, you read it in a book. Um, and obviously we all love books here. I'm, not dissing the books, Saul's Library, um, but it, it can feel a little bit dead. And I think like the, the, you know, the thing that happens constantly, like um, a medieval example of it is when 
um, when trolls get written about by Icelanders, the, 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 because because trolls, as written by um, by you know actual in, in Scandinavia, they feel very much like people because trolls are plotterous, secretly um, <clears throat> Finnish people. They're based on um, oversimplification, I know, but they they feel much. They, there's an earthiness to them. They have to walk into rooms, um, but once these stories get transplanted into Iceland and they're no longer next to Finland. They're no longer about the, the trolls stop being the Sami and they become way more ethereal. They no longer need to step into doors and they just manifest and their they, they, they sizes change and they're much more magical. And, and that, that, that shift that comes from the uprooting fascinates me, mm -hmm. where you come from, where, where through transmission of knowledge, things get lost and misunderstood. Well, not misunderstood, but you, you are, it's uprooted. And that's, mm -hmm. that's great. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, re-understood. Yeah, re-understood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic, or Ellen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> uh, so it's often said that fairy tales aren't solely or even frequently about fairies themselves. Um, but from what we've been talking about, fairies themselves are enormously important to all of us here. Um, and there's been a huge growth since the start of the 20th century in novels that deal directly with fairies, from J.M. Barrie's Peter and Wendy to uh, uh, Hope Merlees's modernist masterpiece, Lud in the Mist, uh, to um, John Crowley's fairy family history, Little Big, to Zen Cho's Sorcerer Royal duology. Uh, so which modern fairy tales delight you and why? I, I was dying to talk about this when you were talking about being uprooted, which is that my uh, wife, Delia Sherman, wrote a wonder, came up with an entire thing in response to Brian Froud saying once in our presence <laughs> that New York City has no magic and no fairies. <laughs> Delia, having been brought up uh, in New York from a small child and played uh, in Central Park, immediately set out to prove him wrong and ended up uh, writing two books in a series <laughs> set in New York Between, mm -hmm. which is the fairy. I mean, I'm interested in this notion of when did we first start thinking about fairy land as opposed to fairies in our world? Mm. But that's a different panel. Mm. But so New York Between, uh, you know, exists sort of contemporaneously, uh, but, but layered with uh, the New York that I live in. But uh, New York Between is full of every single bit of fairy f and folklore from every immigrant who's ever come. They've sort of stowed along with them and come there. So it's this absolute panoply of uh, fairies of many lands. And uh, I, I, really, I really love that. They're just the whole question of how do you bring fairy uh, to the new world, as Terry has successfully done in her novel. So um, that's one. And um, it hurt when the gauntlet was thrown at your at, at your respective faces. When when the gauntlet was hurled at your face, did it hurt? <laughs> yes, uh, I imagine. A challenge. <laughs> a challenge. Oh, oh, yeah. No, it's, 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 I just watched it go by and you know laughed. So that's that's just so um, one that I think. I mean, this whole question of how do you how do you in, have fairy interacting with yes. the new? I see you've got Neil Gaiman's Stardust there. Well, that was kind of Neil's rewriting yeah. of um, the Queen of Elfland's Daughter, mm. which and, and Blood in the Mist, and mm. well, with some Blood in the Mist, you know. I mean, the one thing I love about Neil's writing is that he he's the generation I'm from, and Terry too, who didn't have a lot of fantasy to read. Mm. I mean, you have to understand our desperation. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's not like you kids today. Uh, and so we were all shaped by the same books, which were the, the fantasy novels that got published as soon as Tolkien came out and made money for publishers. But there wasn't a lot, so they picked all these really old things from the 1920s and before. So um, uh, my brain has just gone. Lot in the Mist, we just mentioned. Time. Yeah, no, no, I mean that, that uh, King well, of Elfland's daughter was Lord Dunsany, yeah. mm -hmm. and um, Lud in the Mist, of course, is Hope Merleys. Mm -hmm. So um, I love the fact that, that we're not only retelling fairy tales and folklore, we're retelling the, the books that were, were basic to us uh, when we were young and hungry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I love about the fantasy field in general, but also about fairy literature in fantasy mm -hmm. specifically, mm -hmm. is that we're a field in which books are in conversation with each other. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that's always true in, in mm -hmm. literature, whether writers are aware of it or not. But in fantasy, we're very conscious of our, of our lineage. Mm -hmm. And so when, when Neil writes Stardust, of course he's in conversation with Lord Dunsany and Lud in the Mist. Mm -hmm. When Susanna Clark writes Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norris, she's in conversation with Neil and with John Crowley's Little Big. Mm -hmm. and, and on and on it goes. Mm -hmm. And it, it is 
it makes for a rich reading experience if you follow the, the line of fairy texts that have been published from the 1920s and 30s onwards mm -hmm. into some really marvelous um, f fairy work in this century. Yeah. Frances Hardinge, I saw over over here, she's written a couple of marvelous fairy books, um, Cuckoo Song and Face Like Glass. Is, have I got that right, title right? I guess. And um, uh, which are splendid, splendid. Yeah. Um, Mortal Love by Elizabeth Hand brings looks at the madness of fairy yeah. in both Victorian times and in the present day. Marvelous book. Re more recently, Elizabeth Knox, the uh, New Zealand writer, has written the most unusual fairy text that I've read. It's so unusual, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's called The Absolute Book. So look for that one because she does things with fairy lore that just make your jaw drop. Is it set in New Zealand? It's set all over the okay. damn place. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there are like, big New Zealand bits of it. No, yeah, she's a yeah, marvelous But it writer. comes over to England as well. It's a sprawling, mm -hmm wonderful, bizarre, groundbreaking novel. And I, one would have thought, what is there left to do with fairy lore yeah. in contemporary fiction? Yeah. I, I would like to also thank fairy lore for existing for the people who don't know who we're in conversation with. Like <laughs> Thomas the Rhymer, every single thing in it is based on folklore and balladry. Mm -hmm. And people who have no acquaintance with folklore and balladry Balladry would come up to me and go, oh, Ellen, that stuff you made up about this and this and this was so cool. <laughs> go, Thank you very much. Yes, I very yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I just, uh, I've just finished reading uh, C.S.E. Cooney's uh, Desdemona and the Deep, uh -huh, yeah. which is really nice. Um, it's it's uh, set in this kind of alternate um, Victorian-esque world where uh, the main character is a socialite who's the daughter of an industrialist and this... Um, uh, and you know she she discovers that the secrets of her family that um, someone might be doing fairy deals to acquire um, better mine seams and it and she kind of goes to rescue this group of miners and it's it's quite good it's, um, and it has that it's had that idea of fairies being addicted to human art which is always very compelling to me. Mm -hmm. Great. Wonderful. Thank you for your suggestions. And uh, one thing that has, has always delighted me about uh, about fantasy novels is is the extent to which the acknowledgments tend to uh, be a kind of a, a litany of the joy of reading, a, 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 a sort of a, a celebration of it. And and your writings uh, have absolutely that in them. You know, you, you sort of uh, you have acknowledgments there to the inspirations uh, that that you've that you've derived from a whole range of different things. Not always, of course, recent. Some of them really quite old. So, uh, um, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you brought out that sense of a community, which, uh, which I have a feeling was, was uh, I mean, something that, that, that the exhibition sought very much to bring out, uh, this idea of uh, that the way that when you end the exhibition, you end with, uh, with the fan world, uh, and, and it's, it's sort of the goodbyes from people who have uh, celebrated fantasy and their actions in their performance, which I know that you're involved in, Jeanette. Um, Emma Newman writes some really lovely books um, about setting bath with a fairy world like where the fairies are kind of very much stuck in the regency era mm -hmm. um, but um, she also runs this uh, this live role play game set in the same world setting and my partner catered it um, so um, we were we were experimenting with like fairy recipes with like uh, nothing nothing exciting but just like frozen like frozen grapes little like boulevards and things um, and I was at that um, taste testing party and some of those recipes made it to my book when there was a fairy Ooh, world there yeah. so I enjoy the idea that um, my my fairies and Emma Newman's fairies have the same fairy chef <laughs> um, and and um, my my partner gets to say um, He's catered two different fairy bowls. <laughs> you know, Not though, many I, people could say that. We're, we're supposed to be talking about going into Elfland, and we're not really making the distinction between elves who live here all the mm. time mm. and who and when and how they go elsewhere and take humans elsewhere as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a, a, a key and interesting distinction, isn't it? I mean, the, uh, the she have always been under the hills, uh, and presumably there's something down there to be in. Uh, but exactly what? They've also lived in other places like the, uh, the land of youth, uh, the Tiananog, or uh, a, a whole range of, range of other spaces. Um, what's wonderful about those spaces is that we don't know where they are. Um. Sir Orfeo, the medieval text, is always a great one because mm. uh, it's very obviously based on Orfeo de Orpheus and Eurydice. Mm. Um, uh, but it's very, you know, Sir Orfeo definitely goes to fairyland. Mm. Um, never mind that, you know, when he goes to fairyland to rescue um, uh, wifey, um, 
Eurydice. Uh, Eur Eur Eurydice, but her name's yeah, slightly differently spelt. Yeah. Um, but uh, he encounters a, a number of different creatures who all seem like they're stuck in the middle of death. So there's this monk with like an axe ha halfway through his back. So they're all like, feel like they're frozen the moment of death. And it's this wonderful description. It's quite lurid. And it's like, mm, is this, are we sure this is fairyland and not checks notes, Hades? <laughs> um, well, that's what I think is so deliciously naughty about your book, the notion that they found it and you can take a boat there. <laughs> as long as you get thoroughly lost. <laughs> it's sort of very experimental. <laughs> I'd like to, um, yeah, I'd like to turn now to your own fairy novels, since we've already started turning to them here or there. Um, and I'd like to begin with, with Terry's, if I may, with, uh, with The Woodwife from 1996. It's been republished in 2020. Uh, and it brings Celtic or British, uh, Celtic I prefer probably, fairy lore into conversation with indigenous American mythology to a certain extent. Um, uh, that's probably an inaccurate description uh, because what you do is highly complex. But um, I wondered uh, if you could, uh, it's, it's something, uh, again, that we've talked about a little bit up till now. We've mentioned John Crowley's Little Big, which similarly brings uh, uh, fairies from uh, other traditions into an American context. I think you do it very differently. Um, can you tell me about the impulse to discover fairies beyond the usual settings of the hills, waters, and hedgerows of Western Europe? Well, that novel came out of my life. Where for 20 years, I was going back and forth between homes in um, the deserts of Arizona and a uh, little cottage on the edge of Dartmoor here in England, um, spending six months a year in each place. And in this part of my life, in the English part of my life, I was doing a lot of work with Brian and Wendy Froud mm -hmm. on their various fairy books and was very immersed in British fairy lore. Through, through them. And like with Delia, you know, listening to Brian say, oh, you know, fairies are, <laughs> we don't have fairies in America. It's like, no, we have, we have lore in America. What we have in America is this melting pot of folklore brought by all the immigrant cultures that have come through that landscape, as well as the indigenous tales, as well as tales from enslaved people, as well as tales brought over by indentured servants. You know, there's such a mix of traditions all across America, and in the desert specifically, it's largely Native American, uh, Mexican influence very strongly because it's down by the Mexican border, and then all the various immigrant cultures that have settled in Tucson. So I started thinking, starting with looking, in being immersed in Brian's fairy art, thinking what would the Devon equivalent be. Brian's fairy art is very based on the Dartmoor landscape and gives, for, for him, like for me, fairy is about a way of connecting with landscape and the, the numinous qualities of landscape. I find the, the Sonoran Desert a very magical and numinous place as well. So what would those spirits be? Mm. They're never really named fairies in the book, but they absolutely are. And they, are, they shift mm. according to the person they are um, communicating with. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that I feel as both a folklorist and as a person that our relationship with the land, we, there, there is this magical quality to the land and the stories that we use, whether they're Celtic stories, whether they're Northern European stories, whether they're, for me, sometimes Native American or Hispanic stories, that we, we bring these stories to this thing that we can't describe in any other way, approach in any other way. We don't have a language for that, that quality of enchantment that we can't understand. It's so mysterious, but we feel it. Mm. And so we clothe it with folklore. We clothe it with story. That's the way we approach it. That's the way we get as close to it as we possibly can. Mm. And so... I was trying to write a novel about what happens in a desert, Arizona, South Amer Southwest American desert landscape. What stories might the characters in this book mm. clothe these, th this, these spirits that they feel and approach? And in fantasy, you can do that literally rather than, than talk about a quality of emotion in landscape. You can literally create the spirits that they converse with and mm. interact with. 
I love it that you began by describing the process by which you gradually moved towards creating the novel, because uh, um, in, in The Woodwife, it, it, it seemed to me that fairies become catalysts of creativity. Maybe that's one way of looking at it, that they're clearly deeply entwined with your own passionate commitment to art of all kinds. Uh, you talk about surrealist painting in the novel, folk song, poetry, there's lots of great poetry running right through it, illustrated children's books, and even the art of the gardener or the crofter, uh, sort of uh, bringing vegetables out of a tough soil. Um, how do you see fairy as important to the process of making art? Well, I think making, whether it's creating art or creating family or creating community, is a magical act. Mm. And so fairy, again, is a perfect metaphor to describing the, the magic of bringing something mm. new into the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, when you look at fairy lore, there's so many great tales about fairy muses and mm. you know, fairy madness mm -hmm. that comes from the, you know, creativity is not always a benign thing. Yeah. We can yeah. get lost in creativity. It can go mm. very dark on us. Yeah, that comes across very strongly in The Woodwife. There are yeah. certain people who clearly get deeply get, lost in their creativity yeah. and are I, unable to conduct a human relationship anymore. And because for me, fairy, the, the end of fairy that I'm most interested in is that, that lore that is all about the land. For me, creativity also comes from the landscapes we live in, whether they're rural or urban or suburban. You know, the life that we imbibe from the, from the, the, the land that, that informs us, that feeds us, go, I think goes through us as artists. Mm. And fantasy is a great way of just taking those sort of highfalutin ideas and turning them into story. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think that's exactly right. How do you how do you turn them into story? How do you um, and I, and I think that's that's, that's what, what's amazing also uh, um, in the book is the, uh, the 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 number of arts that you that you represent fairy through. Uh, and that's something which I know both you and Ellen have been involved in, uh, the process yeah. of kind of uh, looking at the way that uh, a single set of creative impulses can manifest its, uh, themselves through many different media, something, again, that the exhi exhibition is keen yeah. to examine and, 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 uh, <laughs> and, and unfold. I, I, I certainly believe strongly that creativity is, the, is one of the most important things about humankind on this planet. Mm -hmm. and. But, but like I said, creation isn't, it is, it start, it, it is most easily manifest mm. in, we can see it manifest in art forms, in music, in painting, in writing. But we all create. Mm. We, we create families. Mm -hmm. We create all the time, every single day. Mm -hmm. And that's always magical. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it's always something we, I think we should take quite seriously mm. because if we don't create consciously, in a good way that brings something good into the world, it's very easy to create things that are very terrible. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I think that, uh, that's, that's emerging from all, all of our discussions this evening is the extent to which fairy, in, in a way, is something that needs to be taken with deep seriousness as well as with joy and, 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 and humor. That, that is in both of your books, the dark side of what happens when you just go merrily into fairyland and <laughs> It's not always a benign place. Jeanette, this is a good opportunity to turn to, you, to your book. Um, uh, your novel, Under the Pendulum Sun, has an amazing premise. Uh, those of you who don't know it, uh, Catherine Helston's brother Leon is a missionary with vocation to bring the gospel to a colonized people, the inhabitants of Arcadia, known to many as Fairyland or Fairy. Uh, when he stops sending letters, his sister Catherine Helston feels the need to go after him to save him, just as he felt the need to save the fairies. So, Jeanette, what interested you about bringing the idea of missions and missionaries into conversation with fairies and fairy lore? Um, a couple of inputs come to mind. Um, so, um, back during my, um, my university days, I, I shared a house with um, an anthropologist, um, and uh, one of the books that uh, she was fascinated by, and eventually I was also fascinated by, was um, uh, Like People You See Through a Dream. Um, it's like people you see in a dream. Uh, it's about Papua New Guinea, and it's about, uh, it's about 
um, it's, it's, a, it's a first contact, a describing first contact. And one of the things that really struck me was the, the way um, the, the people in it, they saw white people and they described it in a way that was um, like they were fairies because they're like, oh, um, we kept finding these tracks and they don't have toes and this is just weird. <laughs> um, because, because, you know, shoes. Um, and and they, would, they would like, you know, there's this clear path through the woods and they just don't walk in the path. They just keep walking into where the plants are. Why would they do that? There's a path here. Why don't they walk like normal people? So, um, so there was, so it's, it's this idea that, you know, of, of the other as people who kind of break rules and I, I kind of, that kind of really lodged in my head. Um, um, and um, same friend, um, Carrie, we, we, we were in uh, Macau together and we were in this little tiny little museum dedicated to missionaries who went to Macau. Um, and we were by, um, by the kind of the facade there as well, uh, built in the 17th century, uh, remains of this um, great cathedral that was burnt down. Um, and so kind of we're digging around and, and I just remember reading like the various little artifacts and kind of talking about the, the, kind of the sheer conviction of people who decided they were going to be missionaries, they were going to go do the missionary thing, and they hadn't, and they were retroactively writing to the Pope for permission, um, and they were kind of they're saying, we're, we're doing this already, but we really, really would like your permission. Um, and it's, it's just kind of like, I don't know, it was very kind of appealing to write about people who are mad enough to do that. <laughs> um, um, because, you know, you, you'd think you'd think it'd work the other way around. You, you would ask for permission first. Mm -hmm. um, and the little things like that kind of all trickled together. Um, and the final piece of the puzzle was a, um, uh, we, were, we were meant to be writing a thesis or something. I, I can't remember. <laughs> but um, again, um, we, we stumbled on this series of kind of Victorian missionary texts, kind of books um, that were meant to be written for missionaries or, or just writing back to kind of describing people. And one of them was about China. Um, and it was kind of describing uh, what Chinese people were like. And they were saying like, oh yes, you know, they have two eyes, you know, a nose and a mouth, and you know, they did the correct number of limbs. And it was very earnest about this in a way that sort of makes you go, well, did you expect them to be different? <laughs> um, are, why, why are you telling me that they have two eyes? Why do, do you? And, and that moment of that sense of the other, and again, very appealing, and this idea kind of sparked from this kind of series of, kind of things kind of rammed together in my head. It was like, oh, it'd be really funny. It'd be really funny if these peop very earnest people were to meet some actual fairies because instead of like, you know, boring old Chinese people who are, turns out, plot twist, act just people. <laughs> um, and, and I thought that would be really funny. Um, and I thought it'd be really funny if um, some fairies were to play some tricks on them, which again, really funny. Um, actually a comedy. Um, so, um, <laughs> So that's kind of where the idea came from. I thought it would be really fun to, to, to dick with some very <laughs> earnest missionaries. <laughs> e e equally funny is that one of the fairies actually gets converted. <laughs> he's, he's, he's I mean, he's you popular. think that. You think that. <laughs> but on the other hand... Who can even guess? Who can, I mean, a Mr. Benjamin could be playing a long game. <laughs> I mean... Um, the other thing is wonderful about the well. There's lots of things that are wonderful about the under, under the pendulum sun, but I love the I love the I love the house that they find themselves in, mm -hmm. which is this kind of nightmare place. Um, uh, I would say that under the pendulum sun could in part in part be described as a kind of love letter to Victorian creativity, not least in architecture, <laughs> um, the mimicking of exuberant creativity, which is, for instance, used in Guillermo del Toro's uh, Crimson Peaks. Uh, a pe peak, rather, um, about which you've written on a, in an online essay. I'd, I'd recommend you all to, to read, Jeanette, on, uh, on Crimson Peak. Uh, but what inspired you to set your disturbing and beautiful fairy novel in the Victorian era? Because obviously you, you have medieval, you have Renaissance in your background. You're, um, you're talking Victorian. I, it is a love letter. Yes. But it's also arguably a hate letter <laughs> to... Uh, yeah, to, yeah. to to, it, it's, it's about defying categorization. Mm -hmm. So one of the kind of recurring things in it is people kind of try to explain fairies. Mm -hmm. um, they, the, the characters sit around and try to explain fairies to each other. 
um, and then they sit around and they can talk about it and then go and then and then plot twist. No, your your theory is wrong. They're just trying to dick with you. Um, <laughs> that, that's the plot twist. They, they 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 the fairies come up with all these elaborate explanations um, and they but the point and they can say maybe we could be explained this way, but actually we can't. Um, and I think that's kind of the joke. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I like, there's this kind of, the paradoxes of the Victorian era, I think, um, that there's a lot of contradictory nature of it, at least in the popular imagination, is still very relevant and very resonant with us, uh, possibly because it is the era we allow to have these contradictions, where it both is this great age of industrialism, but you know, we also have the arts and crafts movement, we have our William, um, you know, William Morris and, and all, this, um, all this kind of counter-industrialism also comes from it. It's this great age of repression and, and oppression um, and colonialism, but it's also the age where you know, it gave us socialism and you know, feminism and, and the great social movements kind of come from that era and all these things happen. And you know, uh, one of the simple reasons why it is full of contradictions is because we allow it to be because it's quite long. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, but because of that, I think, I think that the, those, it's a period that because we allow it to have these contradictions in a way that, that say we don't allow the Middle Ages, we kind of see mm. the Middle Ages in a much flatter way. Mm -hmm. um, that the Victorians kind of still have that power, um, and and it's it's through the Victorians that, unfor for better or for worse, some will argue, easily argue for worse that we understand people like the Middle Ages mm. because it yeah. is it is we don't think of you know medieval manuscripts and things. Um, we think of um, the Romantics painting the middle, painting the Middle Ages. Yeah, yeah. We we don't think of um, you know you, even you know the classic you know um, the classical era. We don't think of the actual classics. We think of the Romantics thinking about the classics, and it's it's through their lens and and so both Same with fairy lore. Well, ex fairy lore as well. Yeah. Um, and then in for better and for worse, I think the Victorians are this weird gatekeeper. And you know also the the fact that all their stuff is out of copyright means that. Um, <laughs> No, I'm, I'm, I'm not lying. Um, it means that you know you you keep seeing their stuff, you know, as free book co as covers for books and things, because again, out of copyright. But um, and and so there, there's this great longevity to it, um, and and like lots of myths and things that they perpetuate still kick around, like. Um, the classic one is um, people still very sincerely repeat in very serious documentaries that people in the Middle Ages spiced their food because all the meat was rotten. Mm. And that's just not true because why would you gild rotten meat? Because spice is very expensive. You, 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 you won't use very expensive things on very, on literally rotten things. It, it won't work. But, but that's because the Victorians didn't like spices very much. So they were like, well, there had to be a reason why they had to do this. Mm. Um, so, so little misconceptions like that, they, they still, they keep going. I love this wonderful idea, uh, idea of the Victorians as a, as, a, as a lens which we can't help but look through all the time. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an very, amazingly powerful idea. Um, and, and obviously, the, yeah. my, my stupid country, um, uh, Hong Kong was birthed in the Victorian era because that was when we got colonized and all those elements came together. I mean, obviously, there's a fishing village there before, but mm. the, sp the, the thing that made Hong Kong what it is mm. is, is... The is, flying is, saucer that landed. Yes, exactly. That, that, is, <laughs> that is the moment that, that it was born as well. So, like, big in my imagination for that reason mm. as well. Fantastic. Thank you. And Ellen, uh, your fairy novel, Thomas the Rhymer, retells us the well-known story of the singer who went willingly with the queen of fair Elfland to her country where he stayed for seven years and came back with the gift of a tongue that cannot lie, which as he points out is really not very helpful for someone <laughs> who likes making up stories. Uh, it's among other things though, the gift of prophecy. It's best known as a Scottish ballad. Um, since we're gonna be moving in that direction, what drew you to, uh, to ballads as a, sort, a source of inspiration, do you think? Ballads were a part of me for, most of my semi-adult life, I think I was 14. No, I remember we would read it in English uh, literature collections. There's Chaucer and Shakespeare, and in between there's this person called Anonymous. Mm. <laughs> and they write all of these long rhyming stories about that. They're sort of like the, like the Italian opera of, you know, the 
15th century, there was these vast, huge emotions, um, but, and there are also these repetitive lines, mm. and um, you know, it's, it's, it was very appealing in mm. many, many ways, partly because, you know, unlike a, a tale that you read, it, 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 it had scansion and rhyming, and just bizarre <laughs> human activity. Um, so I was sort of interested in those, but then um, my dad was always sort of bringing things home to see if anybody might be interested in them. Um, just He just loved the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, he brought home a Ewan McCall record, uh, at, uh, God knows why, yeah. and I listened to it and I was just hooked. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, Ewan McCall was a... Uh, mid 20th century, lots of things, you know, so song collector, but and also singer. And here are these things that I had never heard before, and I hated his voice. I mean, he's he's got this very what we now think of as very folk traditional voice, you know, nasal and you know, forward. But I kept listening to it over and over until I rather liked his voice. Yeah. <laughs> and around that time, the English folk revival revival was happening with, you know, Steel Ice Band and all that. So these became, again, accessible to me in even a vaguely hip and cool way, although I was the very least hippest and coolest person you could ever imagine. <laughs> but, but yet, you know, within my peers, this was an acceptable thing to be interested in, like, and you could read it on the radio. Mm. So they kept kind of coming at me, coming at me, and I, I no longer remember how I, I stayed with that, but it was really an obsession. And then I performed them as well, mm. started performing them, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, saving up my money to get, you know, the Dover edition of the child ballads and reading them, and I just loved it, and it was always a part of my life. Um, but I, other than you know, singing in coffee houses, there wasn't really much I could do with it. But Thomas the Rhymer was really delicious, and a, actually, a, a good friend of mine in high school really loved it. We we read it and talked about it, and she dug up a tune, but she was not a singer. But then. Um, Something about it really spoke to me mm. because he is the artist who goes to the source of all his art mm. uh, and is, is really in the made-up place uh, that most of us think we're just making up. Mm. And, and how does that change him and, and what does that bring back? So I always sort of thought of Thomas the Rhymer as the King Arthur of poets and artists. Mm. And I knew that he was mine and that someday when I was old enough and wise enough, I would do a fantasy novel about Thomas the Rhymer. Well, what do you think happened? <laughs> Terry, who had just done a very successful uh, series of novels by various uh, hot young fantasy writers based on fairy tales, said, well, why don't I do one based on ballads? And uh, she was sleeping in my back room at the time in New York City. And I said, well, if you give anyone else Thomas the Rhymer, I, I just will never speak to you again. <laughs> Uh, so I got Thomas the Rhymer and um, kind of waited until the very last minute and then went up to her uh, apartment in Boston, which she was in Devon at the time, and stayed in her apartment and wrote the thing in about two weeks, listening to all records over and over again, and drafted, drafted the thing. Um, but really, I just want to thank you again for your encouragement and for being a person I knew I could trust to write the story for. And uh, who thought we would be here at the British Library looking at the manuscript pages. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so uh, it was kind of that. But I mean, the other reason uh, we love to write uh, novels based on ballads and fairy tales is because you don't have to think of the plot. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us are not good at plot. <laughs> 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 and it's great, like you've got the plot, nothing anybody does and it makes any sense, and so you novelize it so that it starts making sense. The sort of deliciously weird thing about writing Thomas was that the whole section in Elfland did not need to make sense, which saved me even more time. <laughs> so that was nice. <laughs> That's a fantastic answer. And I, uh, um, uh, well, time, is, is, is not on our side. Um, and I, I would have liked to have carried on with this conversation much, much longer. Um, but uh, the time has come now uh, to journey deeper into fairy. Uh, shortly, uh, Jeanette Terry and myself will retire from the stage and give away to our two performers. One of these is Ellen, who you know already. Uh, but I must also introduce the fourth of our guides to the perilous realm. The musician Sam Lee. Uh, do you want to come up, Sam? Take a chair.
So Sam is a Mercury Prize nominated folk singer, writer, conservationist, song collector, and award-winning creator of live events, broadcaster, and activist. You see what I mean about, you know, you can't sum up any of these people in one word. Alongside his organization, The Nest Collective, he's shaken up the music scene by breaking boundaries between folk and contemporary music. In the process, he's invited in a new body of listeners fascinated by the question of what the messages in these old songs uh, hold for us today. And we've been talking about that a little bit already. His most recent album is Old Wow, and his 2021 debut book, The Nightingale, Notes on a Songbird, tells the epic tale of this highly endangered, endangered bird and its place in culture, folklore, folk song, music, and literature through the millennia. Together, he and Ellen will be performing Thomas the Rhymer for your enjoyment. So ladies and gentlemen, please give uh, Sam and Ellen uh, a very warm welcome and ask a, a, a goodbye until later. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. That was wonderful. Do you want some time to sit up? Or give me a moment. Yes. <laughs> I'm still in fairyland right now. <laughs> keep it. Keep it there. This, I'd like to say that this was created um, specially for this evening. Uh, taking the bits of the book that talk about going into fairyland, going into elfland, and what it does to you. Uh, about creativity and also, of course, about music. And I'm actually really thrilled that um, the, the sub, one of my subplots in Thomas the Rhymer is a ballad uh, called The Famous Flower of Serving Men. And when I mentioned this to Sam in our little meeting before we started the project, he said, oh, I have a version of that that no one's ever heard that I collected from one of my, my good friends in the traveling community traveler community. And I said, oh, really? Well, perhaps we could use that. So you'll be hearing in, in her honor the, the tune that Sam learned from her, but we've altered the words to fit the novel. <laughs> mm. and, and maybe I'll add that um, a lot of the songs that have emerged out, and we're going into the creative process here, um, which I don't want to spoil too much, but I'm very pleased that a lot of the songs have come from the gypsy traveler community from from people I've I've met and learnt the songs from who in many ways have maintained that oral tradition back to the old times and have kept these songs these almost fairy like tales many of them are um, intact right up until present day so I feel like these songs in many ways are a you know a direct line through to that time yeah. so. which is another reason we love them. Mm. What songs do you sing to them in Elfland? There, where all songs are true and all stories history. A man appears, walking on a ridge of the Aelden Hills. He looks like a hunchback, but it's a harp he's carrying under his cloak to shield it from the wind. Or it's goodbye, my darling, it won't be for long, though it may be for years, not forever. For it's I'm going away, love, for several long years, and I would think on my darling forever. For it's I'm going away, love, to see the old castle With a drink in my hand and a gal on my knee And if I could maintain you for seven years more Then I would think on my darling forever We remember this, how one fine day Tom went off walking alone, 
high on the Eldens, where the world, he said, was spread before him like a jeweled map. The only sound, the wind rustling through broom and gorse. He walked out empty handed, and he never came back. And though we combed the Elden Hills, nothing could be found. And so I doubt that we shall see the rhymer in this world again. Oh, England, oh, England, I'll not see you more. For I'm worn out with fever, cast down to death's door. And if ever I live to see seven years more, then I would think on my darling forever. A story may begin anywhere, as the maker chooses. This one begins under the Elden tree. I rested in the moment, smelling the burnt and tangy wild air of autumn, and looking out over the great stretch of hill and sky, the river valley sparkling below. To Thomas lay on Huntley Bank, a fairly spied wizzy, and there he saw a lady bright come riding down by the Elden Tree. I looked and beheld a beautiful woman, beyond all women beautiful. The white horse tossed its head in the foam of its mane, and the silver bells rang. Lady, I said, I do not know you. I know you, Thomas the Rhymer. Thomas of the quick wit and clever fingers, I have come for you to harp for me. Thomas, for your fair fame has reached even unto my land. Make music for me, Rhymer, and tell me your tales. Harp and carp, Thomas, she said, oh, harp and carp along of me. But if you dare to kiss my lips, sure of your body I shall be. Betide me will, betide me woe, that will never daunt in me. Then he has kissed her ruby lips all underneath the elden tree. Now you mun go with me, true Thomas, true Thomas, you mun go with me, and you mun serve me seven years. Through weal or woe, as chance may be. She was all grace and music, as she swung up onto her horse's back. My eyes could not leave her rich and strange as she was against the bright beauty of the world. More than the world, and less. A riddle to be unraveled, a clue to be followed. But Thomas, ye must hold your tongue. Whatever ye may do or see, for if ye speak word in Elven land, you'll never win back to your own country. I took her hand, that cold, strong hand, and swung up onto the horse behind her. <laughs> We were in an orchard, and three roads stretched before us. As I gazed, the mist parted to show me a tiny road of ivory, winding through the forest, field, and stream, all the way up to a distant castle etched fine against a hilltop. That, I said, that is the road for me. That is the road to Fair Elfland, Thomas, where even it pleases you to go. A strange joy filled me then. I felt that I was coming home. It was the place I had always sung of, the vision that filled my eyes when I closed them to sing. I never dared to think it could be real for me. You are a man of earth. Elfland is not your home. I know, but still, Give me my full seven years there. As you wish, but understand this. Whatever the others may say to you, in forest, field, or hall, look that you answer none but me.
I felt coarse, grimy, clumsy among these elven folk. Winged creatures glided like seagulls down from roof and tower, their wings banking and catching the light. Something green crawled up out of a well and sat on the brim with its toes dangling in the water. There was not a plain creature among them. Even the ugly ones rivaled the whimsy of a stonemason in any cathedral. A radiant creature with vast folded wings fingered a lock of my dark hair. Bright, it said, rich. Give him leave to speak. Be shy. Come, child, tell us your name. I knew better than to speak. Let's play the riddle game. That will test his learning. Start with an easy one. The ladies and the gentlemen came inquiring of me how many blackberries grow in the salt sea. Oh, it'd make me sick not to be able to answer. Everyone knows the answer is as many ships sail in the forest. And she gave her reply in the tear in my eye. As many ships sail in the forest. That's too easy. You've offended him. Here. In the forest lies a well. In that well lies a cup. What king's hand dropped it there, and whose will fill it up? That one I did not know, nor do I think any mortal does. I was become the Elf Queen's lover now, living in the land beyond the Blood River, the land of mist and ivory. I harped and sang for the elves at their strange, bright feasts and uttered never a word. I spoke only to my mistress, the queen, when we gave each other joy in her ever-shifting bed. The rest of the time I spent alone, attended by invisible servants who brought me the food of earth, that I taste no crumb of elven food and thus be bound there forever. Time passed as it does in elven land, a year in a night, a night in an hour. Alone in my extravagant rooms, I had only my music to keep me in time. Oh, can't you see that little turtle dove sitting under the mulberry tree? See how that she does mourn for her true love as I shall mourn for thee, my dear. As I shall mourn for thee. I had not sung a verse or two when I felt a sh chill shadow fall on me. But it was still bright noon, and no shadows were on that land. I sang on. Oh, fare thee well, my little turtle dove. Ten thousand miles adieu. For though you go, you'll surely come again If I roam ten thousand miles, my love If I roam ten thousand miles Oh, fair thou art, my little turtle dove You are gone very far from me I hear you see lament and well a day For your tears I cannot see, my love For your tears I cannot see Over my head a whirring sound, wings parting the air Facing me, sitting on the marble edge of the lily pool Was a white dove The dove fixed me with a clear amber eye but I saw no reason to quit my singing. For the seas run dry, my little turtle dove, And the roaring billows burn. 
Her I prove false to the bonny lass I love Till all these things be done, my love Till all these things be done As the dove looked at me, a terrible thing happened Its eyes seemed to film over with darkness But the darkness overflowed And from the dove's eyes fell crimson drops, splashing like rain on the fountain's edge, staining the soft feathers of its breast. The dove was weeping tears of blood. My hand fell still on the harp. Why? I asked silently. Poor spirit, what has befallen you? For the dove had a tale of its own. Of that I was sure. <laughs> The elves came to take me on a hunt. When they tired of chasing whatever it was, leaving me far behind, I found them at last sitting on a ring of tree stumps, drinking out of silver flasks. Let's make a changeling, one proposed, with a wicked glance at me. A green-haired woman with fingers like tree roots shook her head. Let's dance. I bet Harper can make you dance. Without a harp, the first said maliciously. Indeed, without a harp, I thought, and stood myself up on a tree stump and opened my mouth and sang. Whoa, diddly 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 lum, that I little diddly diddly lum, giddly diddly 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 lum, I little diddly lum, diddly lum, bum bum. The elves caught on to the rhythm fast enough. Then, like slender trees themselves, like little bushes and rocks and flowers in their earthiness and strangeness, they began to dance around me. They danced no steps I knew, but danced the rhythm of the music, the dips and weavings of my voice, the pulse that beat through the singer and the song. I closed my eyes to savor my own memories. A wool-tight dance, I was a child. When I tired of capering around the dancers, I crouched under the table and listened to the old woman singing. I had grown up to become a different singer, making music for different dancers in an unearthly land. But in a way, I was become her, too, now. Then I opened my eyes, and there stood a tall elf lord with red lips and scarlet brows and hair as black as night. Once there was a knight. He married a fair and clever lady, and as time went by, had one child, and they were very happy. All would have gone well for them, but the lady's mother was a jealous woman. She hired a gang of ruffians to set upon the knights in his house, and they killed him and the child. All alone, the daughter buried her dead that dark night. And then she did something, something very strange. She cut off all her long brown hair and dressed in a suit of her husband's clothes. And she walked until she reached the knight's court and the king's court, and there she did not seek justice, but service. The knight's widow became a serving man to the king, and over the years her service so excelled that the disguised woman rose to the rank of chamberlain. Now riddle me this, Thomas, what becomes of the knight? I had no answer to the elfin lord's riddle and no way of winning one. All I had was music and anger. My rooms were in darkness. The stars in the sky above the garden were as big as toys, but pale without the sharp, crisp clarity of our own. I took the only thing that felt truly mine, my harp, and played there in the garden under the fuzzy stars in the warm and scented elven night air because I could not speak. I sang my challenge. 
You'll have to make me a cambric shirt of every rose grows merry be time without any seam nor needlework and then you shall be a true lover of mine. As if I were working a spell with them, I sang all the riddle songs one by one without their answers, a challenge to the elven stars giving nothing where I got nothing in return. My father, he asked me an acre of land, oh, blah, 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 winds blah, between the salt sea and the salt strand. And the bonny lass, she blew away my plodies of war. Oh, you must plow me with your blowing horn, oh, blah, 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 winds blah, and you must sow it with a peppercorn. For the wind it blew my bonny lasses plied ease a war. I sang the dawn up, a surly grey dawn without colour, without sun. The elf queen did not send for me that day. What became of the night? How on earth or under it should I know? It teased at me though, the story he'd told. I'd never heard the like before. All alone, the daughter buried her dead that dark night. But I had heard of soldiers using their own swords to bury their comrades, so I tried something. There he sent nine robbers all in one night To rob my bower and to slay my knight They left me nothing to wrap him in but a linen sheet that my love died in. That was good, I thought. That was a beginning. And then... Uh... I cut off my hair and I changed my name from Fair Eleanor to Fair Young Jane. James? Fair Eleanor to Sweet William. I went to court for to serve the king as the famous flower of serving men. For the first time in days, I felt at peace. I'll finish the song, I thought, and then I'll play it for my riddling elven lord in the great feast hall before all the court. That will show him what a true minstrel does with his riddles. I served my king, and I served him well. But who was I, no tongue could tell. I hadn't heard the white dove arrive, but there it was on the fountain, watching me, listening to the song, and weeping its terrible tears. Moved by the strangest sympathy, I made a cut in my skin, and let a few drops of my own blood fall to join the doves. It bobbed its head over my drops. It was drinking them and lifted its head and then it spoke. Oh, Eleanor, alas the day, her tears on my grave. What became of the night? They will not see, they will not hear. I can weep on earth, but cannot speak. I am dead, Eleanor, dead and lost, and cannot help, dead and lost forever. What became of the night? He was here, before me, a voiceless dove that fed on blood like the spirits of the ancients. Already its voice was growing fainter. I have a voice. I thought, and I will give you yours through song, and you will take it back to earth to sing before the king and save your love with truth and a tale, a tale that is true. I finished the song, the answer to the riddle. A man knows when his fate is on him. I did not wait to be summoned to the queen's hall. Arraying myself like a prince of singers, I took my harp in hand and set forth to the elven feasting hall. The murmuring began when they saw me. Rhymer, the queen's rhymer. 
Make us music, Harper. Make us dance. I shook my head. I had one song to sing tonight. They sent nine robbers all in one night To rob my bower and to slay my knight They left me nothing to wrap him in But a linen sheet that my love lied in I cut my hair and I changed my name From fair Eleanor to sweet William I went to court for to serve the king As the famous flower of serving men I served my king and I served him well but who was I, no tongue could tell. The king made me his own chamberlain, and he loved me as he loved his own son. He blessed the day that I became the flowering famous one of serving men. He jesting said I look far too gay For a man's estate and a man's array Our king, he has to the hunting gone To bring down game or the venison All day, all day they could nothing find until they sighted a milk white hind, oh find the hind she led them through branch and stone. She outpaced all but the king alone. She led him where the grass was green, and in that place a fresh grave was seen. And on that grave a dove sat on the stone And there it made a most dreadful moan Alas, the day my love became The famous flower of serving men The king looked on all in amaze, such wonders to behold by day. A love, a dove, that drank and sang lamented long. She's the famous flower of the serving men. Oh, tale, a tale that was all in song. Of the famous flower of the serving man. I stopped there. I had taken the dove's story as far as I might. Its ending now depended on what happened next. Thomas, the queen said to me, can you name your true desire? I had not known what it was until she asked. Let me return to mortal lands with the songs of Elfland on my tongue. The elf queen flung out her arms and laughed in triumph. So speaks the tongue that cannot lie. Come, Thomas, true Thomas, Thomas the rhymer, arise and follow me. It is seven years and your time is come. We rode across the barren plain and down into the cavern whose warm heart the mortal river runs through, the mortal river that whispered of warmth and old, old battles. And now I heard the songs in all of them, all the songs that ever were sung by the men and women of my own land, heard and understood and forgot them in that journey of days 
for years and heartbeats. As we began to climb out of the cavern, a breath of chilly air drifted down the dark tunnel towards us. I gasped as its unexpected familiarity cut into my senses. It is seven long years since first we met So early in the spring When the small birds they do whistle loud The nightingales do sing And if ever I return again I'll take that boy inside And I'll roll him in My very own arms Down by the tanyard side And I will roll him in my very own arms Down by the tan side Down by the tan side It was the smell of earth Thank you so much, uh, obviously, to Sam and Adam. That was just absolutely magical. Thank you so much. We were transported. I do love it when an idea that starts as a little germ of a seed of an idea becomes a night, and you're all here to enjoy it. And thanks to everybody who's watching it, wherever you may be. I hope you have had a wonderful time. Uh, we really don't have time for questions today, but every, our speakers will be out in the bar afterwards for those who are here. Please do have a chat with them and pick up one of their books if, if that, you'd like to do that. And thank you all so much for being here. To Sam Lee. <laughs> Alan, Alan Krishna. And then down in the front row, Terry Windling, Jeanette Ling, and our host uh, earlier, Rob Masson. Thank you for being here.